What you know about benchmark? Uh-huh. They're speaking the facts that you wanna hear. That rapper jersey, the vision is clear. Diamonds glisten like a chandelier. You know what I'm here for, like Michelle Lynch. It clutch time, we do not flinch. Real brothers, we do not switch. Hit home runs with the right pitch. Who run the city? <gasps> what to do when they hating on you? I feel like Kobe 2010. I taking an L, all I need is a win. When? This is his business, you know how they go. They playing the seats, now it's time to grow. Tune in now, gotta be in the know. Showtime, bitch, my butter blow. We know. <laughs> All right, welcome back to another episode of the Bitch Mob Podcast. Of course, we thank all of our listeners, our followers, our subscribers. The podcast would not be anything without Cha. Tonight, we are joined by a special guest, Brian Ferranti. I know him from NJCU. Great times playing ball. Great times being just hanging out, chilling in the cab and things like that. Yep. I'm going to introduce him for y'all. I know Brian, but for y'all, I'm going to do a little introduction. Graduated from NJCU, he was studious. You know, he was trying to get me to do the same. I didn't <laughs> offer the same. Graduated with a 3.9 GPA. Voted to the Capital One second team academic All-America men's at-large team and the first team academic All-District 2 squad. He became the first men's golfer to earn each award and one of a handful to do it in history of NJCU athletics. He's the winner of the Thomas M. Garrity Scholar Athletic of the Year Award and the Gothic Knight Academic Achievement Award. As a senior, three top two finishes, including second place at the Sage Spring Invational with a 79 and at the NYU Poly Meet. And he owns the NJCU. 36 hole record with a total of 161, 82, and a 79 at the 2011 Dowling College September shootout. Yeah, you did your Next, research. Uh, and I no, still have that record? I didn't think I still had that record. They still got it up there that you got the record. <laughs> Maybe they didn't update their system. <laughs> I've seen a lot of, we had a guest on uh, that was playing college football. They never updated the system. So <laughs> my friend goes, he's like, Yeah, so you're a six foot four defensive back. He's like, nah, they never updated. <laughs> they never updated after uh, I'm not six foot four. <laughs> but I think I gotta start off right there. You were really good at golf. Why did you stop golfing? Did you ever think about going on tour? What was your process after graduating? Uh, so for me, I, I mean, I was, I was good at golf, you know, um, but it was never like my, I was never consistently like in the sixties, um, which is like, you know, where like D one golfers, when you look at like St. Peter's and like Seton hall and stuff like that, just from that, from that local New Jersey area, what they were shooting. So I, I was, I was good, but I, I was never, I was never like able to bring it to that next level. And I kind of realized that, you know, I kind of owned that who I was and stuff like that. And so coming into college and coming into NJCU, I really wanted to focus on, on that student part of the student athlete. Um, So, you know, I, it's not that I didn't work on golf because I did, you know, and, you know, I played golf since I was like six years old um, and I always worked on my game and I still golf now, but um, you know, I just knew that it was never gonna just reality check. I think reality check hit me in, in high school, you know, you're never going to make this uh, as a professional career. Um, you're good at other things. You have interest in other things. So focus on both. Uh, so that, that's kind of the route I went to, to do that. Um, at NJCU, that's why I chose NJCU over being like a walk on at St. Peter's and trying to go that route. I knew it just probably wasn't in the card for me. And I knew I had too many interests elsewhere to, to kind of just solely commit to that. Hey, a lot of people don't have that honest conversation with themselves, and especially at high school. Like at high school, a lot of times at high school, you really, it's a lot of kids that think they're going to go pro at whatever they're doing <laughs> when it's sports. Yeah. To have that reality check and that conversation with yourself, was yeah. that solely on you or was that like a collaborative effort with family? That was, it was definitely a collaborative like effort with family. Look, when I was, when I was like in 
fifth grade, I thought I was going to be the next Jason kid, like, like growing up, like, honestly, that's what I thought. And, you know, grow, like, and then, you know, you I played the high school, uh, I played basketball in high school. And I kind of just realized, you know, you can shoot and you can pass and there's a, not a whole lot of other great things you can do. So the re reality check again. So um, it was just kind of one of those things where, you know, um, you know, just having honest conversations with myself, but also honest conversations with, with my family. And my family did a, a, what I think is a really good job of kind of prepping me, you know, to be multifaceted and to have, you know, different areas of interest. So I wasn't always laying my eggs in one basket. Um, but I do think, you know, if I think, you know, from an earlier age on, if I, if I had been like, you know, I, I like worked a little harder and then looking back, there are things that I probably could have done to take my golf game to that next level. I just, I was focused on academics. I was focused on bat. I didn't want to give up basketball. I didn't. So being like, you know, having a lot of interests outside of, you know, golf, maybe in the long run kind of kept me from, from that one thing. But at the same time, I think it made me a more well-rounded person. So I think it just kind of depends on where you're at in life and, you know, what, what passions you have and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'll attest. It was plenty of times he made a lot of people upset at NJCU open gym runs <laughs> with how he could shoot and he could pass. But those now about it. <laughs> those jump when it's for game and he's in the corner. Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot of people upset. You mentioned you started at six. Where did your love for golf like? Where did that even start? Was that watching TV? Did you have family members that played golf like? Uh, so actually I was pissed because you know, I was six years old and my dad for Christmas, we always had this like tradition where we'd save like the, the bit, the best, the biggest gift for last. And I was so stoked. And again, never played golf in my life or really even knew anything about it. And my dad, I opened up my last gift and I, you know, I don't know what I thought it was, but I definitely didn't think it was a set of golf clubs, which is what it was. And I was pissed. I was like, what? <laughs> but, um, so basically, you know, that kind of got my interest into it. He, my dad would take me to like my, the middle school uh, where I went growing up and we'd go out into like the football field and just hit balls and then um, stuff like that. And then I, I, he realized that I, you know, had a natural ability for it. So um, he kind of signed me up for lessons and stuff like that. And I had a pro that I would go to. Um, and I started playing tournaments. I think when I was eight or nine, I started getting in junior level tournaments. So that's how I got into it. And then, you know, there were, there was no, like, like the, the first, I would say like, um, like competitive, competitive golf outside of those, like, um, kind of amateur, um, junior level tournaments I did was, was high school. So. Gotcha. Wow. That's a, uh, interesting story. A lot of times, you know, you hear, oh yeah, I started at six. I just loved it. I saw it on TV. Nah, I was pissed. <laughs> I was pissed. <laughs> But looking back, it was probably one of the most rewarding gifts I ever got. So <laughs> thank you, Dad. Hey, it, it worked out. Um, now, you mentioned, you know, I know you, you ended up coaching too at NJCU. Yeah. So how was that process of to end up also playing and then coaching, you know, the future generation of golfers? Yeah, so I came back, I, I played, um, you know, obviously at NJCU, and then I um, I worked for a year back down in, in Cape May, where I grew up, and then um, I came back, my mentor, Alice DeFazio, who is the um, uh, director of uh, athletics at NJCU, she got me a graduate assistantship to come back and get my master's, and <clears throat> I knew I was going to be working for the athletic director, uh, for the athletic department as a part of that GA position, but like on my second day, she pulls me in her office and she was like, I'm just going to let you know, um, I let, I'm going to let the old coach, your, your previous coach go. Um, do you want the keys to the program? And I was like 21, 22 years old. And I was like, what? You're going to make me an NCAA head coach. Like I've never coached. I have no coaching experience, anything like that. She was like, yeah. And I mean, I couldn't turn it down. So, you know, I kind of took the bull by the horns and agreed to it. That first year was tough though. We, um, <clears throat> The previous coach didn't recruit. I was pulling kids off the soccer team, off the baseball team, um, teaching them how to golf. Um, and it was it was brutal. It was one of the most hum humbling years of my life. But with uh, I kind of realized at that point, you know, that I was better at teaching golf than I was at playing it, which was kind of a humbling realization. You know, you think you're like really good golfer and stuff like that, but you realize you're a better teacher. Um, and you want the kids that you're, you're teaching and the kids that you're recruiting to come in and break your records. That's why I was surprised that record. So, cause I, that's what I wanted the kids that I was bringing in. I wanted them to break my records because my records weren't that good. They need to be broken. So, um, 
you know, I was able to uh, recruit and um, that first year was tough. Like I said, pulling, pulling kids off of different, you know, NJCU teams to, to just meet like quota for the, for the athletic department on our matches. But then, you know, at the same time recruiting and, you know, building up a pipeline of golfers to come in for that next year. And that's what we ended up doing. So. What was the biggest difference between coaching and playing? Like I just heard you mention recruiting, obviously, like what was that biggest difference, especially being the first time you coaching and yeah. coach golf. I think I think that, that that was the biggest realization, you know, because I came in and look, I'm a recruiter now. That that job, you know, set me up for my career really. But um, um, I think coming in, like I knew how to play golf, and I per, I had a, a decent idea how to teach golf and how to relate to people and how to build relationships. But I had no idea w- what everything like on the back end look like to, you know, build a team to make a team, you know, I couldn't go into year two after, you know, having like a rough year one, like I couldn't go into year two pulling soccer players and baseball players, you know, off of their teams just to fill our matches. Again, I realized I had to recruit. I had to build relationships. I had to go into high schools. I had to meet, you know, parents and grandparents and shake hands and kiss babies and stuff like that. Like those are the things that I had to do um, that I had no experience in. So I think that was the biggest thing. And I also think, the the other hardest part the biggest transition was I was like 21 22 years old these kids were about my age so it's like they're looking at me and they're like you know you're like a couple years older than me and you're my head coach so that that was that was a learning curve too and just kind of finding that right balance between you know being you know hard and and forcing you know the standards that I expected in my program but also you know being able to relate to them and know what they're going through for some of our listeners, in your recruiting process, what did you look for in the golfers that you wanted? Like, was you looked at how they golf, their scores? What did you look for when you? I, I, so, like, I, on the surface, I was looking at scores, you know, and stuff. And I'm gonna be honest, like, I'm I wasn't going after, especially that first year, I wasn't going after like top echelon golfers coming out of high school because I knew that 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 they weren't gonna come to NJCU and 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 do that and be a part of a program that last year, like, I had people almost approaching 200s. And if you don't know anything about golf, 200s and 18 holes is is pretty darn bad. So, um, I. I knew I wasn't going to like poach people from St. Peter's or compete, you know, with those D one or even do D two schools or honestly, even like higher end D three schools. What I had to do is kind of similar. I related it to my experience, like why I chose NJCU. I chose NJCU because I, I, you know, I was offered an academic scholarship. I knew that the program I was going into was going to help set me up to be successful in my career. And I could play golf on the side. That was a no brainer for me. So what I did, so <clears throat> if you think back, like all the things that NJCU was doing with the school of business and stuff like that, I realized that, you know, a lot of golfers want to get into business. A lot of golfers are business minds, uh, business kind of mind focused. So, um, what NJCU was doing with the school of business and internships on wall street and everything like that. So that's how I was recruiting people. And that's how I was selling, you know, to these kids and these families, you know, you're, we're, we're building a, a program here that is going to be competitive in a couple of years, maybe not in year one, but maybe year two, year three, we're competing with, you know, teams in the NJAC like William Patterson and, and stuff like that, like that have golf teams, we're going to be right there competing with them. You're able to come in here. You're able to land an intern, be, be with, um, you know, a school of business that's going to land you internships on wall street and stuff like that and wall street west which is downtown jersey city all these things i was kind of able to sell and you know relate because i just gone through the same experiences so when you know families were asking me mothers were asking me why should my you know why should i trust you with my son well here's why so finding a way to like build that relationship and, and make it relatable i think you know was was the biggest key piece in turning the program around yeah that's a lot and especially at that age you just graduated that's a lot on somebody's plate um especially like you see a lot of times i don't know if this is the same maybe in the bigger golf program but you know at different levels they have actual people that just handle recruiting like i even saw it at jcu like there might be six coaches on the bench they're not all coaching two of them are just recruiters so yeah that all on your plate Plus I was getting my masters and it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot, but like looking back, man, that, that was like some of the most rewarding, you know, times in my life. And I don't regret leaving, you know, and coming out because I live in Arizona and I don't regret, you know, 
past, um, you know, walking away from that job, you know, I kind of did what I set out to do, but like, I, I miss that, that job a lot. I miss that program a lot. And, um, you know, those kids and stuff like that, that, that they meant a lot to me and, you know, what we were able to do meant a lot to me. For those that don't really know, like what is one thing that people don't know or overlook about golfers in the sport of golf? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like people always like give it this knack, like it's like, a, it's not a sport, it's a hobby. And like, on one hand, like I hear that a lot. And on one hand, I'll agree with it because like it is a hobby, but like golf is one of the most difficult sports or hobbies, however you want to look at it to, to learn, to, to, to do, you know, it's not like it. And it's, and it's what makes it so hard is it's, it's not a team sport. So it's like, when you fail, it's on you. Like you have no one else to blame. You have no one else to be like, you should have passed me the ball. You should have done this. You should have done that. It's on you. And it's, and it's what keeps you coming back when you have a bad day, because you know, you can come back and, and, and do better. Um, and it's what keeps you coming back when you have a great day. Cause you want to come back and do better than you did. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, between coordination and core strength and, um, you know, endurance, there's a lot of things that when you look at a golfer, you don't really think about, but it's, you have to be athletic. You have to be very coordinated. You have to, you know, be strategic, uh, to be successful at it. There's a lot that goes into it. You know, a lot of people just think it's like you get up there and hit the ball. It's not, that's not how you're good. Um, that's not how you get good. So I think that's probably the biggest misconception. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I wanted to ask about that because we often hear when they have the conversation of like greatest athletes, yeah. they rarely mention anybody in golf. They yeah. it's a lot of we heard Charles Barkley, we heard different. I mean, I still think LeBron James is probably like the greatest athlete, but like I <laughs> heard a lot of people basically say golfers and like bowlers, they all put them in the same category. Yeah there's no athleticism needed for that. Yeah. In your opinion, obviously being a golfer, coaching golf, being doing golf since six, what are your thoughts on those sentiments and what people think about golfers? I think so on one, I, I would, I would kind of, I see, I see both points. I see both sides. Like, so for example, like if you're going to be great, like you look at Tiger Woods, like, that dude is fit. That dude has been fit. Like he works out. He not only does he work out, but he works on his game. It's not something like where it's like you roll out of bed at 11 AM and, you know, walk out to the green and go hit the ball. That's not, there, there's a lot of work that goes into to being a great golfer. Um, it definitely helps you if you're, you know, physically fit and you work out and you, you have great cardio and you're, you know, a lot of it's core strength. But then if you look at it, like John Daly was like 250 pounds and he's out there, you know, smashing golf balls, 500 yards. So, I mean, he's not really an all time great in my mind. And I think if you look at the golfers that are great, they are extremely athletic, like Dustin Johnson, long arms, huge, great frame. He can crush the ball a mile, but then he also has like, you know, a lot of touch around the greens and stuff like that for, you know, placing the ball in intricate places where he needs it play. So I think, you know, if you're looking at like, when I think of it, like an athlete, well, the reason why I said that thing about LeBron James is because like, I feel like you could put LeBron James and in a football uniform on a volleyball on like beach volleyball or does or baseball it doesn't matter where you put him that dude's gonna crush it like I don't know that like Tiger Woods would I think that he's athletic but I think he's just refined his golf game so so well that you know he's arguably the best golfer that's ever lived so speaking of Tiger Woods uh with everything that happened to him recently the accident do you <laughs> think he's going to return to golf um, and if he does, will he be able to, you know, ever get back to that, that level? Uh, I mean, I hope he does. He, you know, he's what got me in the golf, you know, being like, he's, he was like my first role model, um, you know, at my athletic role model. Um, so I certainly hope so. And I, I, I'm going to say yes. And the reason I'm going to say, if there was anybody else besides Tiger Woods, I wouldn't say yes. I would say absolutely no. But I mean, that dude's come back from so many things before that I never thought he was going to come back. Like, you know, everything, you know, with, with, the, with his ex-wife and all the scandals and back surgery, multiple back surgeries and all this stuff. He came back and won a major when, again, when nobody said that he could, when everybody said that he couldn't do it. So I, I definitely hope so. And I think if anybody, any athlete can, it's, it's him. So. Yeah. I, I hope so too. Um, for everything that he's been through, I hope yeah. and crazy car accident like that, I would hope he's able to get back. Of course, most important thing is health. So if, it, if he just is able to have his health. Yeah. Cool. 
long as long as Tiger is good. Um, you mentioned, of course, Tiger and other golfers, how they refine their game. What would a typical day be like for you if you were trying to practice or work on your game? What would it consist of? Um, I think, you know, a lot of people like just like want to go to the driving range or top golf or, or whatever. Like that's like kind of like the like stereotype with golf that, you know, you just kind of get up there and crush it or whatever. But I think to, to be for someone that's like looking to like really refine their game and like get into golf, like it's important to like not even start with golf. It's important to, you know, like when, when I was like in high school and college and stuff like that, I would get up in the morning or I'll go to the gym and I would go for a run. I would work on my core strength. Um, you know, I, it, cause a lot of the power and a lot, it, you don't have to, you don't, you honestly in golf, you don't want to be the bulkiest person because if you are super bulky and super like ripped across your torso, you can't get your arms around your body to make solid contact. So building up that core strength, especially in the off season is definitely imperative. Um, and with golf too, especially like in, in high school and college and you're walking everywhere and it, it, that 18 holes adds up. That's a lot of miles. And, you know, so kind of doing that, you know, doing 18 holes a couple of times a week will like just help you build up endurance and stuff like that. But in terms of practice, um, I, and my, my high school coach, he used to tell, he used to tell us this. And at the time I was like, what are you talking about? But he would say that 40% of golf, the entire game of golf is putting. So it's what you do on the green, you know, <clears throat> what you do with your putter. Um, and a lot of people, when they think about it, and I remember looking back, I would be like, I don't know, I'm not interested in putting. Like I want to crush the ball. I want to put the ball close and then I'll figure out a way to get it in. But, you know, a lot of your strokes, when you go and look back and evaluate where you spent them, you know, if, <clears throat> if you had a, if you had a bad day on the golf course and you go and look back, you know, how many putts I had, how many, you know, how many fairways did I hit? How many greens did I hit? All that stuff goes into it. So working on your short game, I feel like is super imperative. You know, I would do these drills where I would line up, <clears throat> you know, uh, like a, like a half circle of balls around like a small hole, not even put to a regular hole because I want to try to put it like sometimes I would even put a T in the ground and I would just, you know, putt, 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 because I know if I can hit that T when it comes time for the real thing, I can, I can sink it in that big hole. So kind of finding ways and practice like that to make it harder on yourself, because it's going to be a lot easier when you go in a tournament, when you go in a match, you know, to, to get the results that you want. If you're making your life harder in practice, um, you're going to see those results a lot better, you know, when it matters. Yeah. I've golfed a couple of times that putting, it's yeah. like different. It looks easy. Everybody's like, it's like mini golf. It's like, nah, it's not, it's not, it's not like mini golf, dude. <laughs> it's something different, man. Like I've, like I said, I've done it a couple of times. I'm like, golf is hard. I, golf is hard. Maybe it's cause I don't have experience, but I feel golf is harder than a lot of people really think. Like you said, it's not top golf. It's not mini golf. Yeah. It's much more than that. Like a lot of people hit the ball far. Yeah, now you got to play the short game. Yep. It go from all right. Now you at seven putts when it was only supposed to be two par. Like, yeah, and it's like a lot of it's like being strategic. Like you look at a golf course, like there's bunkers everywhere, there's water everywhere, there's trees everywhere, and it's like yeah, you can. It, that's great if you can hit the ball a mile, but if you're hitting the ball a mile into the woods, then you got to hit it out, and then you got to get it back up. You know, it's like so. There's a lot of things like that where it's like sometimes like you know longer and sometimes stronger isn't better sometimes a lot of times in golf it's about you know being strategic and can you you know and we call it like touch feel um especially on around the green am i able to put that ball where i want to put that ball because if i'm just getting up there and whacking it a mile every time again that's great but you're a lot of times you're doing more harm than good to yourself because then you got to get out of that situation. And if you go in the water, then you got to drop and take a penalty. So there's all these things where it's like if I just want to get it in the fairway like um, what I would have my golfers do after like a round is <clears throat> while they were playing is I'd have them keep track of how many uh, fairways they hit and how many greens they hit. And by greens, I mean like if, how many um, strokes it takes them to get them on the green and then two putt. So if it's like a par five and they're on in three, they hit a green. If, they, if it's a par five and they're on a four, they didn't hit a green because now they have to one putt to hit par. So like when you go and the more they kept track of that, they would be able to like look back and say, and say, okay, here's what I did wrong on this hole. Here's what happened. And here's that, how I can kind of like correct it next time. So. Yeah. Um, that reminds me of if I had to translate it, like you talk about in basketball, when you mentioned touch, like those big 
strong dudes. Yep. What is so like enamoring about them is when you see a big strong dude have touch. Same thing when you talking about with the punt, like even when football, can I place it where I want it to go? Which yeah. is a lot easier when it's said than it actually doing it. Like to yeah. put it exactly where you want it to go. Yeah. I well, think it's that's kind of like in today's NBA, if you got a big, if you got a, a big that can stretch the floor and he's out and you know, he's out there hitting threes and at a consistent rate or whatever, or you've got like Andre Drummond, who's in the middle, like, like barreling, like, pulling down like 25 rebounds a night or whatever. But yeah, for lack of a better, <laughs> better comparison. Yeah. I think, like I said, when you hear it and you got to really do it, yeah. I think you start to, at least for me, I have a different like respect for golf and I know that's not my thing. Yeah. Uh, I know you talking about you had players going to 200. I was probably 250, 300. It'd it be making me so mad. Bro. <laughs> when you could do certain other sports, I could do ba- basketball, baseball, yeah. football, and then I got the golf. Like, yeah. I can't get a, I can't get a hold. <laughs> but, like, if you, but if you think about it. basketball, what's Steph Curry's second sport? And why is he such a good three point shooter? Like, if you think about it, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of validity there. That dude can splash threes like nobody else. But like, again, I think that's a large reason why he's good, good at golf is because he's super accurate. He's super precise, you know, he's super refined and strategic and he's not just going in there and looking to crush the ball a mile. So. Yeah. Steph is a problem on the golf course too. Yeah. Speaking of Steph, perfect transition. What do you think of Bryson, Bryson DeChambeau? Do you think his style of golf is kind of similar to Steph in that it'll change golf? Yeah, I, I, de- I definitely think so. And if you look at golf, like I, I love him. And if you look at golf, um, like Ricky Fowler was the same way. Like he, people, he started wearing orange and white and like the flat brim hats and everybody else was like, the hell is this guy doing? Like Ricky Fowler did the same thing. And Tiger Woods did the same thing. Like before Tiger Woods, like it was very like guys wore dress pants and like stiff, like polos and like, were super like, like refined. And he came in and he changed golf. He got people interested in golf. He got my generation, our generation interested in golf that like, if it wasn't for him, that wouldn't have happened. And then I think like, like, um, like Ricky Fowler and, and stuff like that, like those are for the next generations that that's, what's keeping kids interested in golf and, you know, letting them come to their, their parents and be like, yo, can I get a like set of like golf clubs for Christmas? Because they want to like emulate that. They see the, they, they see the, they think they relate to that. So. That's so true. Um, I'll probably said his last name wrong, but I've seen, I've seen him. I've seen Fowler on ESPN. I'm like, yo, this is not yeah. the typical golfers that you see. Ricky Fowler it looks like he just like crushed a wave down in like Saint, Santa Monica. Like he just it looks like he just got off the beach and like. <laughs> but it looks like they're having fun. Like yeah, I, yeah, yeah. They're out there having fun. And I think that's what's needed yeah. in the gener- in younger generation. Like that's why you see people want to play basketball and football because the players look like they're enjoying it. Yeah. They're having fun. Um, and you don't you don't always see that in golf. It's like yep. few and here between, you know. Yep. Um, speaking of that, though, like with them, how they bring an entertainment aspect to golf. For the people that, you know, find golf boring to watch, do you think there's anything that needs to be, you know, changed or altered to make the sport more entertaining? Or is it more of like it's an acquired taste? I think, I think what they're doing now, if you look at like a lot of the charity tournaments that they're doing, like the, like Brady and uh, Peyton Manning and stuff like that. I think that stuff, like, even for me as someone that likes golf, as someone that's always played golf, that's even making me more interested in it. Cause it's like making it more fun. It's almost like the all-star game for like the NBA. Like, it's like, like, yeah, there's golfers and it like feels like an active player on tour and stuff like that. But like, they're making it fun. They're making an event. They're making it for charity. They're making it for a good cause, which is going to get people of our, like of our generation into it. And it's like, and it's funny. You got them like talking smack with each other. Charles Barkley is the king of talking crap. Like, like it's, it's, it's me. Again, I think that's a good way that they're doing it to, to make it fun. You see these like, like football players, basketball players are getting involved with and with it and i think kids like kids nowadays are looking at that and they're like oh like you know steph curry plays golf too like i 
I want, maybe I'll try to play. Maybe like they're getting them interested in golf. So I think the more like PGA does stuff like that and, you know, professional golf kind of like tries to get creative with it. Um, and lets these big personalities in to kind of be who they are. That's that's what's going to keep people interested. That's what what's going to keep ratings up and keep the sport growing. So that's true. So you in in Arizona now? Yep. Have your sports teams changed, or are you still? Uh, I believe uh, Spurs and Philly. Nah, yeah, uh, Spurs like secondarily. I'm a diehard like Philly fan. I, I grew up loving Tim Duncan and David Robinson and like Sean Elliott and stuff like that. So I like the Spurs will always be a hold like a, a soft spot in my heart. But I'm, I'm a big Philly Philly fan. So mainly Sixers, Eagles, uh, Flyers, and Phillies. But like kind of secondary, but mainly Sixers, Eagles. Those are my big big two. That's a lot of that's a lot of Philly love right there. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I feel like, I feel like once I moved to Arizona, I became like even more of a diehard fan because I'm out here and I see how like stupid Arizona fans are. And I'm like, I, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so straight Philly, how do you feel about your Eagles coming up this season? Are you believing in Jalen Hurts? I, I, I like, I like Jalen. I like Jalen Hurts. I, and I like, I like what we're doing, but I, I mean, this isn't going to be our year. I don't think next year is going to be our year. You know, if you look at free agent signings and stuff like that, I think like two, like, and I think that one of them was a re-sign that like we pulled over Hargrave again. Like I, like, <laughs> so I, I think like, and it, and it sucks because like, I know last year I was like, I was, I'm a huge Darius Slay fan. I was so pumped to get him a cornerback. Our, our defense is just like our defense and off, offensive line has just been rattled by injuries for, for so long, even, you know, in our Super Bowl year, it's just so, just so long. And I, I feel like now they, they're stripping the roster down, going towards a rebuild, which, which I can get behind. And I like Hurts a lot. Um, so I like that, but I just, I don't think we have the tools, you know, in place. To, and I never trust the Eagles in a draft ever. So <laughs> Howie Great. Roseman needs to go. Like that. I, Howie Roseman needs to go. Transition to your Sixers, who are in a much better position. How do you feel about the 76ers? How do you feel about Embiid, how he's playing? Do you think they have enough? Embiid, Ben Simmons, and I guess Tobias Harris is your big three? Yeah. Um, I, I love Embiid. I love his personality. I love his Twitter. I love everything about Embiid. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I love Ben Simmons and, and I, I never got on board with, you know, a lot of my buddies that are, that are fellow, you know, diehard Sixers fans are always like, you know, get rid of it, get rid of Simmons, get rid of Simmons. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And like, I, what I love about this year is they hired the right coach and, and the right GM and they find, they found ways to make that work. Um, so anybody that says they need, still need trades, Ben Simmons after the year he's having, I, I don't even want to talk to, but, um, I do think that we need something. I think it, like what Brooklyn's doing, is like, I don't even know how they keep doing it, but <laughs> like, we do need something. And I, I think I saw today that the Raptors aren't going to trade Lowry. Um, <clears throat> I, my, my thing is I would have, I would love for them. I don't think it's going to happen this year, but I feel like Bradley Beal, maybe you have, I, I don't want to give up Simmons and maybe you have to for Bradley Beal, but I think he he's the perfect compliment like star for that, for them. Um, or Zach Levine. Um, I, I don't, I don't see it happening by the trade deadline on either front. Um, but Daryl Moore's always got something up his sleeve. So I, I'm confident they'll do something. I just don't see them landing like a, like a perennial all-star at the deadline. Yeah. Daryl Moore, even back in Houston, he always making moves. So I'm sure they'll make some type of move. I think, I don't know exactly what was needed, but it's just to me, I think I just need a closer because yeah. when it comes to playoff time, this is how I envision it with the sixes. I I very much feel like in B compared to Shaq when it was those Laker years, yeah. but you knew those last three minutes, Colby was going to close out the game. Yep. I ben don't isn't trust close out a game. Ben Simmons not going to close out a game. I don't trust the bias Harris. Nope. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't either. I, yeah. And I, I feel you. And that, that's, that's kind of my pain with it. So like, I mean, as much as I love them, I don't see us beating Brooklyn in a series. Um, you know, if, if, it, if those were to be the two teams in the Eastern conference finals, I don't see that happening. You know, I see us winning games against them. We have won games against them, but I, I don't, I don't see it because we don't have that closer. And that's why I feel like, you know, like a Levine or like, 
Bradley Beal that they are closers. And like Joel Embiid is a closer, but like, again, like what you said about Shaq, like he, and I feel like he does have more handles and more range than Shaq did, but like, you're still not going to, he's not a do it all like floor general, you know, can hit a turnaround three like Devin Booker or whatever the case is. So I don't know that that is what worries me. And that's why I was hoping for a third star, but I don't know that that's going to happen. Yeah. That's my thing with, with Philly. Cause like, was it yesterday or the day before the game they went into overtime i'm watching it and it's cool Cormaz he hit the three but i'm looking i'm like tobias was just yelling two days like two games ago he's an all-star this was your time you were supposed to be taking that shot but it proves to me doc if doc ain't draw it up for you doc don't believe in you as a closer either so that's a cause for concern for me Last one before we transition to like our rapid fire segment yeah. we call it with the quickness. What is one piece of advice you would give to somebody that wants to get into golf? I, I would say like, like, like bring yourself to golf. Like don't lose who you are. Don't think you have to like fit into a cookie cutter mold and, you know, like, you know, do exactly what a, what a, if you go to a professional or something like that, what your pro says or something like that, you know, I think it's important in golf to bring your individuality to it, you know, be yourself. There are things that like, as a coach, I would get on my, my golfers for doing, but at the end of the day, like it's, it's them out there on the course, you know, it's, it's a, it's a you sport there again, like I said before, there's no one else to blame. There's no one else to rely on. So don't lose sight of yourself and don't, you know, you need to build yourself up, build your confidence up as you're learning the game of golf. So whatever chip you have on your shoulder, whatever swag you have with you, bring that with you and don't lose that. Um, because, you know, when you're out there and, you know, it matters and you're in a match or in a tournament and, you know, stuff like that, a team's relying on you, whatever the case is, like that's what's going to, you know, get your team and you over the edge is, is, is you. So that's what I would say. I think that's good advice, um, especially, like you said, with where golf is trying to take it. Yeah, and being entertaining and getting more youth involved, I think that's definitely great advice. First one, what's your go-to meal? My go-to meal, oh man, uh, I'm a, I'm a big I, I I still love an Italian hoagie. Like, <laughs> and you probably call it a sub, but it's I I'm from the south and I call it hoagie. <laughs> so yeah, probably still an Italian hoagie. Okay, Wawa, which I don't Wawa. have out here. <laughs> Wawa that they just built one by our way. Jealous is underrated. A lot of people, <laughs> especially remember when Jersey at NJCU, a lot of people didn't know what's a Wawa. I know, I know it, but a lot of people didn't know about Wawa. What's in your musical rotation? Wait, I missed that. Sorry. What's in your musical rotation? Who are you listening to? I listen to a lot of country. I'm going to be honest. Um, so yeah, a lot of like uh, like Florida Georgia Line, Mitchell Tenpenny stuff like that. I'm super backwoods redneck type of roots. So that that's that's the type of music I roll with, dude. Hey, Jimmy Butler put me on Florida Georgia Line. I saw yeah, it, dude. <laughs> yep. I was like, oh, that sounds good. So yep. I, I love Florida Georgia Line. Jimmy, Jimmy love that. <laughs> he also loves Taylor Swift. So yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy loved that for sure. Who's your favorite golfer on tour right now? Uh, Ricky Fowler. Ricky, Ricky Fowler. I mean, and, and if Tiger, if Ty, I mean, Tiger is like my, my favorite golfer of all time, but Ricky Fowler right now, I just I have, I have a lot of respect for what he's done for the game and stuff like that. If you could take a piece of five pro golfers game and put it in your arsenal, what would it be? Like five, like name five golfers. Or yeah, five golfers that you'll take something from their game that you like and put it in uh, your Dustin Johnson definitely. Um, I, I he's got he's got great power. He the way he whips that ball and puts it right where he wants to. Tiger Woods just all around game. Uh, Ricky Fowler short game. Um, what he's able to do with like spin control and stuff like that. Um, Shambo as well. Um, I think those four, and then Justin Thomas too. That guy is just like like a machine every time. The way I play golf, I'm just kind of like. I save myself a lot. Like I'll hit it in the woods, but then I'll save like par. Um, like Justin Thomas just right, right down, right down the middle every time. And I, I, I wish I could do that. <laughs> cool. So who's on your Mount Rushmore of golfers? I would say Tiger, Jack. You got, you got to have Jack Nicholas up there. Uh, Arnold Palmer. 
and um, I'll, th I'll throw a vintage one up there with Payne Stewart. I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with him. Rest in peace. But he uh, he brought the plaid pretty hard. <laughs> Who's your NBA champion this year? I mean, I gotta say the Sixers, but I I, I don't see I, I see I see Brooklyn winning it. I mean, unless unless two out of three of them are down, I, I see Brooklyn winning it. So, I disagree. I see the Lakers pulling it out, being yeah. bought as a Lakers fan. I, I think, just I just worry I just worry about like the like I like I'm not saying that the Lakers don't have depth because they do, but like I just. Like it's like LeBron and AD, and outside of that, you know, I don't know. That's why I think it's going to be huge what both both of these teams do in the trade market and the buyout yeah. market, because yeah. it's rumored Andre Drummond wants to come to both of those teams. So I think whoever get their hands on him first, yeah. Uh, if the Lakers were to get him, that that would be that would be huge. That would that would be absolutely huge. I personally agree with you regarding the deaths because last year, I think it was dumb that they let go of Dwight. And Javel, you should have kept one of them. Yeah, I mean, but they they got Gasol and they got um Trez, but like I, it's I'm not saying that, and they have like Schroeder and stuff, and I'm not saying they don't have depth because they do. I just worry that like, like like to me, Brooklyn, like you have like you obviously have Kyrie, you have uh, KD, and you have Harden. You just got Blake. The jury's out on on whether that's going to be a, like a lasting impact into the playoffs. But then you got like Joe Harris, that is like arguably one of the best shooters in the game. Like arguably, like the guy's insane. And like, like you, like you have like, you know, some of that young talent that they have on the bench, and they're not deep by any stretch of the imagination. But I feel like they're like five and six and seven guys are just kind of like a lot better than anybody else's five, six, and seven guys. That's the thing. I'm like, to me, I rather would have had Dwight or Javale over Gasol on the defensive aspect. They led the league in blocks actually as a team. Yeah. So in a situation like this, where you play. Obviously, assumingly, we think in Brooklyn, they don't have that many strong bigs. DeAndre Jordan is kind of on the back end of his career. So imagine if you had yeah, Jordan, they have Blake and um, what, Claxton, technically? Yeah. Is kind of tall. So that's just my thing. But I still think yeah. if we got a healthy AD and they add one more piece, I'm just super biased. I'm going to say Lakers in six. Last one before we get you out of here. Again, we thank you for hopping yeah. on. Five people dead or alive you'd like to have a meal with oh tim duncan he's my all-time my all-time uh uh idol um tim duncan uh i would say tiger woods um tim duncan tiger woods kind of spacing people i would have a meal with <laughs> you're not bringing pop uh, I feel like he would like get annoyed with me for some reason <laughs> like, before we even like broke bread, dude. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say Allen Iverson. Um, I'm a big AI fan. Um, and then uh, David Robinson, a lot of respect for him, loved him growing up. And um, I think Payne Stewart too. Like he, he's kind of one of those guys in golf for me that like even before Tiger really tried to change the game. So I think those are five people that, that kind of like really shaped my view of athletics and sports and stuff like that, both from like a, you know, high, high level performance standpoint, but also from like an etiquette and just being good people type of things, you know? Yeah. Mission just right there. Etiquette, good people. Yeah. That whole sports organization, especially during that time, definitely spoke that and you were really a Spurs fan because you was bringing out names like Sean Elliott and Avery Johnson at yeah. point guard so yeah. you, you actually Mario Ellis. <laughs> yeah those were the days they had a lot of battles with the Lakers I remember watching yep. that yep all the time they was yeah. really really a problem I think a lot of people too they don't they don't value Tim Duncan in that conversation of you know the greats when you talk yeah, about it was because he was no flash he was no he was just mr fundamental he would bank shots in every all night every night and walk off the court and not have anything to say and great and his playoff record and his champion yeah. is better than a lot of the people that they throw up there as, as yeah. a great. i think he definitely goes overlooked in that conversation yeah. but 
we appreciate you for hopping on. We thank you for hopping on the Bench Mob podcast. This will be available on all streaming platforms, on YouTube. Definitely check it out. Definitely give them a follow. But y'all know the vibes. Bench Mob, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Bench Mob, we out. Peace.